Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for our New Ways of Working panel. Um, we are taking questions at the end of the panel on Slido. So if you do have any questions, if you want to hop over to um, the Slido site, and that is the number on the screen there at the moment, so 69814. And I will pop it into here. Oh, Kurt's already done it as well. Fantastic. And like I was saying, you know, thanks everyone for joining us for our new ways of working panel. At the moment, I think it's pretty undeniable that the world's changing. In fact, it's it's pretty rapidly changed over the past couple of months, and, and it's certainly going to continue to change, particularly as we start coming out of isolation. And... Um, as, as terrified as people like me are of change and want everything to go back to normal, um, you know, I, I think we need to face this reality that that might never happen. Which leads me to our panel today, where we'll be talking about the changes that we've already seen, what we're going to continue to see, particularly in terms of people, technology and delivery. But most importantly, we're really hoping that you're going to leave here today um, with some insight into embracing disruption and navigating the new. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce you to our panel. Uh, so first up, we have Kurt Brown, um, who's our General Manager of Sydney. So Kurt has held senior leadership and CTO roles across the US, UK and Australia. Most recently, he's led the DS Sydney office and been a key part of setting the direction and strategy for the business. Kurt brings with him, with him a wealth of experience building resilient teams and helping well-known local and global brands navigate through times of disruption and uncertainty. Next up, we have Jaziba Zreka, who's one of our lead consultants in product and delivery. Jazz has led delivery and consulting engagements across some of Australia's largest enterprises and non-for-profit sector. She brings with her expertise across product development, project delivery, business analysis, as well as lean and agile practices. And finally, we've got Tony Davis, who's one of our client engagement principals. Tony's led sales, service and operational teams throughout APAC. He now works closely with DS clients on their digital transformation journeys. Tony brings with him a deep-seated knowledge of the Australian market and the impact of emerging technology solutions on it. So let's kick off with our first question around key technology trends. So Kurt, I am going to hand this to you. What, what's been your take on how the technology in play today has factored into our ability to respond to the changes that we've seen? Thanks, Barbara. I think, um, like any situation, it's always good to sort of look at the impact of what's happened before we can then lend our, our thinking towards trends and predictions and those sorts of things. And so I guess my sort of overall um, take on, on my personal observations as well as observations I've, I've um, shared, shared with a number of other people has been that the technology that we've had in place has actually on the whole coped pretty well um, with the situation that we've had here. And I think it's worth reflecting even simple things like uh, mobile phone penetration. Obviously, we, you know, the, the COVID safe app is um, a, a topical thing and probably a contentious thing to bring up this early on a, on a, on a call. Um, but if you look at that uh, particular uh, solution, if we were to go back uh, even really five years in Australia, um, you would have needed to get effectively every smartphone user to download that app in order to get the sort of penetration that we're talking about. Now we're talking about half of the smartphone users, if not less of those to, to sort of do that. So I think it's interesting to look at how well placed technology was in terms of VC, in terms of tools like chat, Slack, these sorts of things, in terms of our um, remote collaboration tools, um, such as um, Jira and some of these other kind of um, uh, tools that are, that are out there, as well as kind of drawing tools and all, all that sort of stuff. Those, those um, technologies that have been there have, have let um, the workforce continue. 
Uh, I think it's also interesting to look at um, cloud uh, and certainly from personal observation, businesses that were well aligned to cloud and particularly native cloud um, coped with very little disruption at all in their, in their operational systems. Those that had bits and pieces of cloud or no cloud um, had a very steep learning curve to, to go through to, to, to really um, learn and, and cope with the, the new environment. And what sort of trends do you see or do you expect to emerge from companies as, as they respond and react to some of these um, changes in technology? I think there's two that really kind of spring to mind and one is um, speed to market. So we've seen, um, I guess, organisations be able to cope and be able to react, not all organisations, but a lot. Um, you know, there's an anecdote of a supermarket giant doing years of work in eight weeks. So you've got to question what they were, what, what really why it needed to take years in the first place. Um, but obviously that's going to create an appetite. That's going to create an appetite for more things that should be done in weeks rather than months, rather than years. Um, so I think that's one of the trends that will come out of this. People will see that, that, that it is possible to do some of these things, to take a leaner, um, more iterative approach to, um, to technology deployments. I think that's one of the catalysts that'll come out of it. I think there's also going to be a, 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 a real clear trend around um, digital and and kind of consistent digital experience. So we will have, we will have seen organisations spring up instances of AWS Connect. We'll see them spring up instances of chatbots. We'll see them um, set up websites and those sorts of things. Now, given those things have been deployed so rapidly to market, there's going to be disjoint there. There's going to be disjoint in terms of customer experience. There's going to be disjoint in terms of um, sustainability and maintainability of those um, of those channels between handoff between those channels and so on. So I think there's going to be a period of time of bringing those back together. Um, but I think the the, the 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 need for people to go digital first in this period will translate to a desire to stay digital first. And I think that will shift a little bit from people thinking as customers, why do I need to go to a branch to do that particular transaction to businesses taking that position? Why do I need to ask you to come in here? I should be able to deliver this service um, digitally. So I think there'll be an acceleration of um, that omni-channel um, digital first kind of thinking that was already sort of there, but I think a lot of organisations are going to lean into that or be forced to lean into that as a result of um, the work that's that's just gone put through. Absolutely. And so, Jazz, I mean, you're, you're at the cold, cold face of, I guess, dealing with a lot of these collaboration technologies and helping to implement, um, you know, things like cloud, et cetera. How, how do you think the technology is keeping up with what we're doing? Well, I mean, I don't think we're quite where we should be in 2020, to be honest, um, particularly around sort of collaboration. Um, you know, where is our VR and AR? You know, we've got the tools, we've got the platforms, but no one seems to be really sort of harnessing them. Um, and, you know, you know, video conferencing does its job. Um, but when you're sort of collaborating and trying to facilitate, um, you know, being able to sort of have a virtual project room where you can actually touch things, move post-it notes around and have that sort of project room rather than sort of, you know, your video conferencing has its challenges as well with, particularly when you're working with new people and trying to build those relationships. Um, I think it really would help to sort of break the ice and I'm quite surprised it hasn't really taken off. We're not using it. Um, I, I'd really kind of would hope that, you know, we sort of do go down that path of really starting to, to use a technology that is available to us. Absolutely. And so, Tony, I know you're dealing with, with a lot of clients that are looking at, at new and emerging tech. Um, is there any insights that you've got from there? Uh, yeah, thanks, Bhavna. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, everybody's been talking about, you know, sort of AI and ML for sort of quite a while now. But I guess, you know, one thing I, I think will sort of evolve out of this is, is um, a lot more practical use of machine learning. Um, and that's probably just given the sort of explosion in, in data. Um, that we're sort of likely to see from everybody being digital like all the time now. So I think that's definitely one to keep a close eye on. Absolutely. And so I guess when it comes to um, impact on project delivery, I guess, Jazz, I mean, back over to you. What do you think has been and will be the impact on how we deliver projects? Yeah. So, yeah, so one that I've sort of observed personally is just around kicking off new projects. I think sort of existing projects and when you've got an existing 
team formed, there's probably no significant impacts. I mean, there's a lot of work that still needs to go in to make sure that, you know, the team sticks together and you stick to the vision. Um, but really sort of kicking off those new initiatives, um, particularly those early stages where you're trying to collaborate um, and you're working in a distributed environment. And I kind of touched on it with, you know, the tools that we have available. They do, they kind of do the job, but they're not really, um, really sort of helping us accelerate. Um, and there's a lot of sort of investment that needs to happen up front. I think particularly it's really important from a role of a product owner as well that they're investing the time in sharing that with the team um, more than they normally would. Um, particularly, you know, we do tend to sort of have siloed conversations, um, particularly while we're sort of working in a distributed environment and really sort of making sure that, you know, we're communicating with the entire team and sharing that vision. Um, I think it takes a lot more effort when you're working in a distributed environment. Um, to make sure that no one's missed and that everyone's receiving the same communication and is in line. Um, so I can't emphasize enough around that sort of the communication um, and just making sure everyone and keeping that alignment together. And that's where I sort of see the, the biggest impacts. I think existing projects, um, you've got your sort of team formation um, and, you know, continue on the communication, of course. But the biggest hurdle I see is new teams, um, you know, building building the relationships with new team members as well. Uh, particularly if you don't know them, you don't know are they having a good day or they're having a bad day. I think it takes you a lot longer um, to actually get to know them on a on a personal level and be able to sort of pick up um, and gauge sort of where they're at and try and help them along if they are stuck on something. Absolutely. So the other day, one of our DS team members rattled off some statistics around remote working to me. So he mentioned that pre-COVID, there was around 90% of the Australian workforce that worked remotely. During COVID, it's hit 90%. Um, and sorry, pre-COVID 10%, during COVID 90%, and post-COVID, they're expecting that it's it's not going to bounce back, that there's still going to be 30% of people who are going to want to stay working remotely. So what impact is that going to have on, on how we deliver projects and, and, and how we deliver it in blended delivery models? So I think there's, there's positives and negatives that, that come with it. And I think some of the positives are the fact that we kind of empower um, you know, our team members to work how they want to work and where they want to work from. Um, and in that, you probably have a lot more sort of an engaged sort of team. Um, but taking, you know, I guess some of the negative impacts that it can have is if you are working across multiple different, you know, different time zones, um, you know, how do you structure your teams? Um, you know, how does that sort of play out from day to day? I know a lot of, you know, there's a lot of successful companies that work completely in distributed, but they have some really strict guidelines around the overlap between time zones. Um, and it really takes a lot of thought and planning in terms of how you sort of structure that team and, you know, what sort of team members you have as well. Um, and I, I guess it just also goes back again to that sort of communication around um, making sure that silos don't aren't created because they can easily be created in this environment. Uh, you know, we do have tools such as Slack and it's really easy to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one person and not sort of open it up in the team channel as an example. Um, and it's the huge emphasis, I guess, from a, from a, de a delivery uh, lead um, product owner or any sort of lead on the project just to ensure that we aren't sort of um, having solo discussions. I mean, these happen in normal sort of, um, you know, face-to-face -face environments as well. But I think um, it's a lot more significant once you sort of work in this distributed environment. It's a lot easier um, for it to happen and just sort of keeping the team engaged more than anything. Um, that they're sort of the, the biggest impacts. And I think there's a lot of ways you can minimize that is ensuring that you have a really sort of strong communications plan um, that the, the entire team agrees to um, and ways of working, um, social contracts and constantly just revisit them and see are they working. But, you know, again, um, as always, have your retros and, you know, learn what's slowing the team down, what's, you know, what's helping the team and, and, and just constantly learn and, um, you know, put that into sort of your delivery plan. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for, for that insight into teams as well. Um, and in terms of, I guess, coming back to keeping up with changes, I mean, Tony, what should businesses be doing now to keep up with, with the changes that we're going to see? Well, now's the time to invest, right? When the chips are down, that's uh, when, you know, the opportunity is to kind of really sort of get ahead, um, to take some share, um, to work on things that will increase your speed to market. Um, so I think that uh, really sort of companies should be looking to invest in their people and their technology and then also um, in those processes that can drive innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I think one area sort of particularly where, you know, sort of clients, 
could really work on and, and sort of focus in on is that whole idea around product thinking particularly. Certainly. Well, talk to me more about product thinking. What is that? Is that like design thinking or? Yeah, so product thinking definitely um, sort of um, relies heavily on design thinking. So it's being led by your customers, um, by, you know, their needs, their desires, their motivations, really sort of understanding their pain points and the problems you need to solve um, from a customer's perspective. And then I guess the key thing is then frame that within the scope of business viability. Um, you know, what can the business afford to do at this point in time? And how's the business going to kind of get benefit from that, whether that's cost savings or revenue drivers or some other sort of level of engagement. And then, you know, then looking at it through the technology lens. So applying a technology that's feasible, that's flexible and sustainable for your business. So it doesn't have to be like the latest and greatest technology, um, but it just has to be something that can work. Um, but then more importantly, can be sort of maintained and grown and further developed by your business. Um, so, you know, and the key thing is to, you know, don't overinvest, um, sort of get something. Product thinking is kind of really about getting something small out there in the hands of users, that concept of MVP, taking that lean approach, but then being able to iterate around that really fast so that you, as you learn, as your customers and end users um, are using that product, feeding that back into your um, development loop. And do you have some examples maybe of, of where you've seen that happen? Um, yeah, well, a recent example, actually, there's uh, a new client that we've uh, sort of recently started working with. It's in the mental health space, um, which is sort of obviously like very topical um, with what's been going on. Um, you know, this is a pretty well-known Australian mental health agency. Um, they've recently sort of gained access to a, a clinically developed, uh, internationally accredited program for the treatment of people suffering um, with some serious mental health problems. Um, but it's a very content heavy program that requires support from a specialist. So the reach on that is pretty narrow. Um, so these guys, their ambition is to broaden the reach of that program by refactoring the content and delivering it digitally through mobile phones uh, to put it in the hands of a lot more people. And that should give it a much broader impact. And, you know, ultimately, hopefully that can save some lives. Um, and I'd say this particular agency uh, or organization, you know, chose to partner with DS for probably for three key reasons. There's the engineering expertise um, that we bring to building software. Um, but there's that whole sort of idea around helping them um, with that product thinking and developing their ways of working. Um, and then I'd say also, you know, some things around big picture thinking too, like how far could they take this? Totally. Is there any other areas that you'd recommend people start investing in other than the product thinking element? Yeah, well, look, I think it sort of builds on that, but it's really building a structure and a culture of innovation. Um, within your organization. By, so by structure, I mean, you know, the ability to run lots of experiments with lean teams, working agile, using data to measure and guide your way to success. And then culture is all about providing the right environment, you know, where it's safe to fail, where teams share knowledge, where they can learn and evolve. Um, and I'd say like a pretty good example of that, uh, which is sort of fairly close to home uh, within DS over, you know, the last sort of a couple of months um, where we've sort of adopted that, um, you know, kind of you know, sort of build quick, learn fast sort of thing is with our sales and marketing campaign team. So we've set up these tiger teams between sales and marketing. They're small, like sort of two or three people um, as a core team there. And the idea is to explore and exploit ideas and activities for business development. So we're running tests, we're developing campaigns across a range of domains um, in customer experience and cost optimization. Uh, around machine learning and healthcare. Um, and yeah, we're, we're sort of learning pretty quickly. And I'd say that, you know, kind of probably four or five months ago, we weren't even close to being able to do that. But, you know, we've been able to kind of arrange that pretty quickly and, and get moving and get some traction. Yeah, absolutely. And so Jazz, over to you. I mean, is there, what, what do you think people should be doing to keep up with, with, with the changes that are coming? Yeah, I mean, I have to absolutely agree with sort of what Tony's mentioned there around experimentation. Um, you know, that's something that I'm kind of constantly, you know, you know, before sort of COVID as well is with our clients is how do we sort of test out ideas quickly and fast um, just to, to prove that they're going to work. Um, but then again, around the data side of things, I think, um, you know, it, it, 
you really need someone as well that can read the data um, and understands it and knows how to tell the story of a data because sometimes we can easily sort of misinterpret data and t make the wrong decisions on that. Um, but yeah, I think definitely sort of innovation is really key. Um, I'm a you know really firm believer that this is a time now to kind of, you know, if you can, if you've got the means um, to go out there, experiment, um, pivot. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity out there um, and, you know, your competitors might sort of have their tools down and it's a real sort of opportunity for you to kind of um, get a foot ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Kurt, I know this is a bit of a bit of a passion area for you, the disruption readiness and resilience and um, keeping ahead of innovation. Is there anything else you'd like to add? That's usually because I'm, I'm the disruptive force. But <laughs> um, no, I think it's I think it's a good rather than specific things. I guess what I'd like to, to, to talk to is maybe a bit meta level. I think, you know, there's a good expression about never letting a good crisis go to waste. And I think this is actually a good opportunity for organizations to learn about themselves um, because the next disruption is already coming it might not be global it might be just your market or it might be a competitor it might be just your company it might even just be your team that gets hit by something but something's going to come along it's going to be unexpected um, so I think it's important not just to be prepared and and to learn resilience and to learn how to cope with those things but I think this is a good opportunity to learn how your organization learns um, how it evolves and how it makes decisions um, so I think it's good as, as we sort of start to find our feet a little bit in this moment, uh, a good opportunity to, to, for people to assess, well, what went well and, and, and how did that work? Did that work differently than before? And if it did work differently than before, what was it about this new um, decision-making process or communications-making process or um, way of doing business that, that, that worked? Uh, and similarly, if something didn't go well during this this um, uh, uh, process. Maybe it's specific to this process, but maybe there was already a hole. Maybe there was already something existing there, and this really just sort of shined a, a light on it and 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 looked at it. So not only just looking at that particular thing, but why was a hole allowed to sit there and be unaddressed? What was it about your business that allowed that to happen? Um, I think also looking at the emerging leaders in your business who stepped in or stepped up in this process and what was it about them that enabled them to do them? What, what was it about them that motivated them to do that? And that, that's a, a real clear cultural lesson that you can learn uh, and you can apply more broadly um, outside of this um, particular climate we're in. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, and look, that kind of wraps up our, our panel to today, we are taking questions. So if you have any questions, if you wanna head over to our Slido page, um, and again, the number is 69814. I believe we've already got a question on here. So panel, the question is, you mentioned team collaboration and communication on remote projects. Do you have any tips for kicking off projects and running remote retros effectively? Jazz, I might uh, yep. to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess some of my tips for kicking off projects, um, it, it's really, I, I sort of mentioned, but I didn't talk about it in a lot of detail around investing the time in really sort of planning it out. Um, so understanding, I guess, who needs to be involved, uh, what tools are you going to use, um, looking in with, within your organisation, are there any sort of governance around what you can and can't use, privacy concerns, um, you know, and, and just, assess all the tools that are out there, such as, you know, I personally sort of used uh, Miro, Mural, um, you know, there's also different video conferencing as well. For example, Zoom has breakout rooms. Um, so it's really about assess assessing as well how many people that you need to have in those sessions, um, but ensuring you've got the right team. And if you are sort of working over different time zones, what is that schedule? Um, I think also just in the time that we're in with, with COVID, are there any sort of distractions that could potentially that need to be planned out in, into the project as well. So for example, there's a lot of people that are homeschooling at the moment. Um, is that gonna impact and just understanding where the team team is at um, and what sort of influences are, are they having on their normal day-to-day -day work? Because um, I think sometimes we might just assume it's business as usual, um, but we are working from home and there are often disruptions that we need to be aware of. So just, I guess, understanding that, doing that planning up front and sort of maybe having one-on-ones um, just to understand that sort of background. In terms of running retros uh, remotely, um, you know, again, you could sort of, I, I've used a couple of tools to run retros recently. Um, I've used Miro, um, really simple. 
um, you know, you can draw whatever you want on there, whether you want to have your typical sort of what went, what went well, what went wrong, um, what can we improve on, um, or a sort of a sales ship, you can kind of just put a picture on there and get people to sort of engage with that. My tip on that would be, if you are sort of using Miro, you might want to use color-coded notepads just to know if you want to know who sort of put what note up. Um, also used a lean coffee sort of style for retro recently. Um, that was a really good introduction for the team just spice things up they all sort of really enjoyed um doing that sort of style but it also kind of um made sure that we weren't spending too much time on the one topic and the team had um choice in whether we invested more time or moved on to the next topic so i guess try different things spice things up because i think what i found personally is um team does teams do get a bit bored with the same same old same old so i tried using different approaches yeah, absolutely all right, next question. Do you think the pandemic has affected how we view data privacy? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. It kind of has been quite an interesting thing for me, but I mean, I don't think it on its own will affect it, but I think it is actually a reasonably important touchstone for people because it is so pervasive. It is um, so, so real to people, whereas I think a lot of other data privacy um, conversations that have certainly dominated our industry have been pretty abstract for the average average person um, and they've been unable to really connect with them in any sort of meaningful way as to what impact it has on them. Um, what I think we're seeing here is a clear example of um, uh, an organisation needing to demonstrate um, the benefit that the customer gets for that sharing of that data. Um, so I think that's really been the clear um, example here. People have seen uh, the trade-off, um, they've uh, and, and they've accepted that. Whereas I think a lot of the other data privacy conversations that are in the, that have happened in the past, either people haven't sort of seen any sort of trade-off, or they've been naive about that. So I think there's you know good examples there. I know the um, Atlassian founders, for example, was you know that they. they um, uh, sort of use the example of people loading games that share way more data than what COVID Safe does, and people just do that without even thinking. Um, and so I think those sorts of things will will educate people. I don't know that this will necessarily make data privacy less of an issue. If I'm honest, I think it brings into into um, contrast a lot of things. Actually, um, it brings into um, into focus uh, government using open source, for example. Um, and what that means for governments in terms of security and openness and those sorts of things, um, what it means for their speed to market. The only reason they were able to bring it out so quickly is because they were able to do that, lean on open source, for example, um, but also government use of data and what that, uh, of cloud, sorry, and what that means for data privacy, cross border, all those sorts of things. I think there's a lot of stuff there that's still gonna um, find a way to, to, go, to, to go, but I think it's a very, it's gonna be a very kind of watershed moment in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And with the rise of, of digital and, and contactless becoming the trend, are we going to see the death of cash? Tony, do you <laughs> want to take this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I'll have a crack at this. Um, certainly sort of no um, expert in sort of currency and, and payments and all that. But uh, yeah, just from a personal perspective, absolutely seen that um, so many uh, organizations particularly that sort of local level are uh, no longer um, sort of taking cash um, you know so that everything's gone contactless payment whether it's cards or phones um, so I'd say it's probably a, a pretty early sign of that um, you know it's probably sort of been a little while coming um, you know probably more interesting question around that is like what sort of impact is that going to have particularly on um, you know kind of the homeless Sort of people of the big cities, for example, that just rely so much on um, sort of cash handouts from people, um, sort of day in day out. So I think there's there's probably like an interesting sort of problem there to address from a sort of societal point of view. But um, yeah, it certainly looks like cash is probably on the on the way down. Absolutely. So this week, Twitter announced that their employees will be allowed to work from home forever. What are your thoughts on this? Did did they? I don't. I don't think they did. I think if you if you read the tweet, it says that um, they will look at um, most employees being able to work from home if they can. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of a, a, a it's an interesting sort of take on what they actually said. I mean, I think there's certainly um, going to be more uh, openness to work from home. 
uh, and to work from anywhere. I mean, from DS's perspective, we already have uh, people in Western Australia, in Tokyo. Um, we've had people um, do stints uh, from the US, from Germany and so on. Um, but that all, for our business, that always requires the client to sort of buy into that arrangement. And, and in some cases, we have clients that are very open to that. In other cases, we have clients that need some convincing. And in other cases, we have clients that are just absolutely no way they sit in the office or, or they don't work sort of thing. So I think that, that will, will push a little bit um, on that. I think to Jazz's point before about different phases of the project, I think that's more what we'll see. I think there will be certain roles and certain phases of projects where it absolutely makes sense. It doesn't really matter where someone is. They can get on, they can crack on, they can do the job. Um, obviously, um, you know, with the right support and the right um, comms and so on. Um, but I think there will still be moments where it will make sense um, to try and assemble people um, for short activities and those sorts of things. So I think there'll still be a bit of a tension there um, as we as we move out of this. But I think certainly the barriers are going to be a lot um, a lot uh, reduced from where they where they were. Absolutely. And so I guess do we? This the next question. Do you anticipate a resistance to new ways of working? Um, I mean, I've got some initial thought on that. I think there was resistance um, until now. Um, I think we're seeing that sort of resistance being broken down sort of pretty quickly um, by virtue of necessity. Um, you know, I know from, uh, you know, from a sort of a client sort of management perspective that there's often been a resistance to, to people, you know, kind of working remotely, working from home, not being in the office. Um, I mean, sort of most organisations have generally been sort of receptive to that, but there's kind of shades of grey in that. But I think now this is absolutely sort of proof that it, it can work and it does work. So I see that resistance, yeah, sort of really being kind of bowled over, to be honest. So next question, what happens to your traditional brick and mortar businesses? Are they going to be around when we come out of this? Uh, well, they're going to have to evolve, I guess. Uh, they're going to have to evolve and adapt pretty quickly. We've seen, you know, I think what's happening right now is sort of accelerating that, uh, you know, kind of complete shift to digital by, you know, by sort of years, um, you know, whereas it sort of may have been, you know, like the extreme laggards might have been like sort of five to ten years. I think, yeah, really sort of having to get on top of it kind of mm -hmm. now and if... Um, you know, if you're an organisation that sort of doesn't have any, you know, sort of cloud or or even sort of data centre, um, you know, sort of IP-based networking, um, then you've probably had to shift a whole lot of your hardware out to people's homes or equip them with new hardware, which is a costly exercise and fairly slow. So um, I think, you know, this would just have really sort of changed the thinking and, and really start to accelerate that um you know, sort of shift to digital, at least for, you know, sort of the pure bricks and mortar uh, type of organisations or retailers. Absolutely. I think that's it for all of our questions. Does anyone else have any any final questions they want to um, send through? I mean, we're more than happy to take them via Google Hangouts as well if, if, um, if you're not able to get onto Slido. No, no other, no other questions. We're also happy for anyone to call them out if they just want to call it out while we're on the call. No, I think that might be it. I think you might have covered everything, answered everything. Yep, sounds like it. Sounds like it. All right, perfect. Well, thank you everybody for um, for attending and, and for joining us today. Um, if you do have any other questions or if you think about anything else that you'd like to um, you'd like to discuss on this topic, um, feel free to pop over to the community slack, and um, and I can always fill the questions back to the team if they're not around, but um, they're certainly on that, that channel as well. Well, thanks again, everybody, and, and have a lovely evening.